right with communion because it's so important. We're going to be talking about the lost harvest today. The loss of the harvest. In other words, we can lose this time. You ever lost anything that you could not get back? You ever you lost your mind? Well, we're going to have some care of that somebody else. Don't, don't, don't be losing your mind up in here. Up in here. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm talking about? You ever lost something? And uh, it's just I lose my wallet about every six months. <laughs> but okay, about every six months, I'm there. What's wrong with you? I lost my wallet again. <laughs> my social security card in there. Every credit card I own is in there. My driver's license in there. I had a passport ID card that was in there. My birth certificate in there. Even why you got a birth? I don't know. I carry everything. But I lost my birth certificate. I lost everything. And there's this overwhelming sinking feeling. Like, oh, I got to go get in that line. Oh, this going to cost me money, right? Oh, oh, man. And you just go back. But you know, you get on the other side of that, you feel pretty good because you get all that stuff back. So I'm talking about losing something that you cannot get back. That's something you cannot get back. A harvest that is lost. A soul that is lost cannot be retrieved once the Lord's come back. Yeah. Today I want to talk about that. I want to recap a little bit of uh, the first three lessons for all the harvest is ready. Because some people say it's not. There's not open people in the world, but there really are. And uh, I want to talk about that and recap. And then I'm really hoping, I want to stir some emotion in you. I don't want you to be the same today when you leave. I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to see if any of this has made sense, or made impact, or imprint. But I don't want you to be the same when you leave here today. See, I think too often we just go to church and get something look for a good, feel good feeling. But that's not what we're about today. I hope you feel good being in church, worshiping with one another. But today I have some specific goals in mind. To break your heart. And perhaps motivated in a different way than it's been motivated before. You remember we talked about the Lord in the heart. We talked about this is, you know, church is here to win people to God. It's, it's when we teach a different gospel, uh, uh, when we teach that prosperity is what the church is about, about getting, about this and that and the other, when we teach that, then we cause a great disillusionment in people because if they don't get those things once they're inside the church, they go, God ain't with you. And oftentimes, what people view in the church is because of what people in the church take out into the world to be viewed. Yeah. And so, we need to understand that the harvest is the reason the church exists. That all the other things that we get, you know, we give with things, get the husband, get the wife, get the house, get the car, get all those things. Those are just because God, He loves us. But sometimes we get them when we shouldn't have them. I know what I'm talking about. But God is a great God and a merciful and gracious God. And so obviously he wants to take care of his children. But the reason he gave up his son is so that he can have a relationship with his children. Yeah. And that's quite the difference. And so the Lord of the harvest saw this in Matthew 9. We'll read the three backdrop scriptures for each of those lessons real quickly. In Matthew 9, verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news of every kind of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, now, right there was enough. You ever read scripture, and each time you read it, you get something new? Yeah. This hit me, you know, look, look at this phrase. He goes through all the towns, all the villages, he's teaching, proclaiming the good news, there must have been some bad news. You know, it's bad news when you are without God, and you have no hope, but here's some good 
good news. You're a sinner, but you can be saved, you know. And he says, so he's proclaiming this good news of the kingdom, not good news of the world, about what God can do. And then he sees, he starts healing every disease and every sickness. And then this is the next statement. He says, when he saw the crowds, so many people untaught, so many people that haven't heard the good news, so many people that need healing from disease and sickness. And when he says he saw the crowd of them, when he saw the crowds, he didn't talk about a specific person or anything. Just when he saw the amount. And now you understand as he goes on. He had compassion on them. Whoa, he was overwhelmed. My goodness. And he had a great compassion on them because he saw something. That they were harassed. They were, they were being troubled. Satan harassed. Satan is pushing them all around. You know, what they've had is not right. And he said, and this is the sad part, and they were helpless to do anything about it. You ever felt helpless? Yeah. So they were flat helpless to do anything. It felt like that in your sin, right? Like, before the Lord came and got you, like, I'm a mess, I'm no good, there's nothing to it, why even live half the time? But he didn't pray for them at all. It's not a true thing. He did not pray for them at all. He said, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep drawn astray. So then he turns to his disciples. He said, man, this house is pitiful right here. So many of them. This crowd, there's so many of them. No spiritual implication. There's so many. And then he didn't pray for them, but he prayed for work. He said, man, so many. Hey, this is the Lord. You got to say, this is the Lord, Jesus, who's come down from heaven in bodily, humanly form. And is a not as, as far as the, the, the conversion of a heart is not allowed because of a free will issue to, to make someone come to him. Right. That's got to be a choice that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Come on. Okay? And so so he doesn't make them. So he gets overwhelmed here in the sense of, well, what am I I can't do this alone. Even with this big crowd, there must be so many more. And so he says, give me some workers. Please give me some workers. And send them out into the harvest field. So we see the kind of heart that the Lord of the Harvest had. full of compassion, yet was overwhelmed with the sheer amount of people there were and his need for more workers to help him do what his father sent him to do. And then we talk about the love of the harvest. John 4. We talk about the love of the harvest that we have to love the work of the harvest. Come on. Says my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent, who sent me and to finish his work. And to finish his work. We talk about it takes work to harvest anything. It takes a lot of work. It is not easy. It is not easy. I mean, because all y'all took work. You know y'all took some work. I'm so fired up. Had our new sister here and everything today. The Heidi. But she took some work. She said, yeah, I think so. Y'all heard her story. Hey, where's China? Where's she going? Yeah, you know you took some work. You took, you, 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 you took a double dip. You know, you needed some more. Yeah. And it takes work. You got to work. At, you got to work to, to help you. It doesn't happen by osmosis. Let me tell you, it's a whole lot of work for me. I remember the brothers, they, they were talking to me, and I'm just listening to what they're saying, and all of a sudden it just dawned on me what they were saying. That I wasn't right with God. That I wasn't saved. I said, what? Here's about four of them sitting there. They were in my house. In, in my house, don't tell me something like that. Come on, Corey. I stood up in my biggest fashion form, almost to my tiptoes, and said, Get out! Get out! 
Y'all got to go. Take your Bibles, take your notes, your little blue books. Y'all got to go. And they left, but they know it's going to take work, so they left and they get back with about eight cars full of other brothers. <laughs> I saw them come to my car and I said, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> they just they loaded up on the road. They were, they were, man, they had a gym gear. They couldn't work. They didn't. Come on now. Come on, Lord. And they came to work. And Lord knows I'm so thankful that they did. But it didn't work. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. But, but you got to love it. You do it. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to do anything that takes work unless you have that passion for it, unless you love it. This is not going to happen. You guys got stuff you love to do, and you just do it because you love it. My daughter, uh, thank God, will be home on Tuesday, but she's the weirdest kid. Uh, we, I love her. Uh, I like to play basketball. My, you know, my entertainment, my relaxation, if you will. Y'all know that. She like to read these books about this thing. And say, oh, Kim, and in physics, and, uh, and I noticed on my uh, Amazon account one time, there was this, this book, this physics book that was uh, ordered, and it came to the house, and I, I decided to take a peek, I'm like, school doc, why do you want this book? I said, like to read it. So I looked at this physics book, I said, what's wrong with it? <laughs> what's, this, this ain't my child. There's no way. I was like, this is crazy. He's like, Dad, this is so interesting. She's bringing stuff out of the book that's supposed to be interesting, and she's excited. And Dad, if you do this, 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 and then I'm going. You want to play basketball? <laughs> well, when you love something, you do it. It's not even hard to you because you love it. You really love it. And that's why you do it. And there's a law of the harvest. That was the third thing. And the law of harvest just, just says there's a reaping and sowing. When they reap in tears. When we talk about being able to reap, I think we're crying for the loss. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, sometimes that's difficult for me. And even as I preach this lesson, sometimes when you preach, you preach it to yourself. And, um, and, 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 you know, I do what I do every day. It's not, you don't have to light a fire to me to, to, to evangelize your body or anything like that. But sometimes I don't know if I'm feeling what I should feel. Is there anybody been there? Yeah. I'm not sure. I felt it. Um, on August 19th, we have like each year we have this like reunion with me and my fellows that played basketball at this particular park up north that we grew up in. And, uh, and, and, and you know, I was excited about the post that was going on about the, you know, the event that's going to take place. And we, we do all kinds of crazy. We play these games and then we have what's called a crip line. You might know what a crip line is? I don't know what a crip line is. No, we ain't talking about like that. No, no, we ain't. We ain't. They go back and say that family up there preaching in crib walking. That's not what I'm talking about. But we have we have this crib line we call it, and that's where we all be aligning like a layup line, and we be dunking and going crazy, doing all kind of things like that and everything. And I'm just trying to figure out what this script line is going to look like with all, 50, all of us over 50 years old get together. <laughs> <laughs> Let them sing too hard. <laughs> I was playing in my 50 and over league. I was playing in my 50 and over league. And, and you know, I got started feeling myself. I was having a good day. You know, I had a little flashback to about the 40s, you know, uh, something like that. But, uh, I made a move that made the dude fall down. Oh. Yeah, that's why I said, oh, I really feel it, yeah, right? I said, I put it on him, right? And he was over there, hey, you know? I put it on him. And then it was just me in the basket. I was like, I thought, I'm going to fall down. I'm not jumping and dunking it. I, I swear to you, it was every game I just had to run this dude up. I back and just. And I walked to the other end. But I was looking at that photo of all the guys, and I thought about one of them had become a, a, a Christian, but he fell away. But none of the others were Christians. They had me in fear, my boys that I grew up with. And I was thankful for that, not 
that, you know, of course they haven't come to the Lord, but that I can feel. You know, the shortest scripture in the Bible says that Jesus wept. The Bible says they sat up in Jerusalem resolutely. In other words, he wasn't weeping for himself. He wasn't weeping because he was going to go through torture or anything like that. He was weeping for a completely different reason. All the losses, all the souls that were there in that city that he was going to try and get. So we got to keep our feelings. When we lose our love, when we lose our tears, we can begin to really lose our faith. And that's how our harvest is lost. That's why we're going to talk about today. Turn me to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. I had to dig a little bit. Uh, there are many scriptures to use. This one just hit me profoundly. And you know, we're going to talk about it a little bit. It says in verse 20 of Jeremiah chapter 8. It says the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. That is that just slack. Yeah. Now this is Jeremiah, who you know has preached and was in the courtyard and preached for like 50 years. There's no evidence that he ever saw a, a convert at all. That he that he worked his tail off and he stayed faithful even in the midst of his unjust imprisonment. And there was no there was no evidence of any conversion, yet there's no evidence that he let up. We know he cried. We got the next book. We know he cried a lot. I, I, I want to ask you a question. Here's the first of my questions. For those of you that have listened to the first three parts, we know the Lord's heart. We know the love we must have. We, we know the Lord. What has changed in your convictions and actions towards your personal evangelism? Now, it's going to work. Come on. What has changed in your conviction, or in your heart, in your actions, in your personal evangelism? This, this passage is stunning. It's when you see what I mean here momentarily. There was a. I love my basketball, but you know, sometimes we don't get much respect in the educational department. And some of those stories are true now. I'm an educated man, so. <laughs> um, but as engineers played, some of the fellas, some of the boys, the athletes that were superstars and all that, and the engineers looked at them and said, hey, we can beat them, we're smarter than them. They may be big and physical and all that, but we were way smarter we could beat them. So they got a game because they started playing. And in this game, it was stick and tug, it was back and forth, and they were there. And the game came down to it, 64-63. And so the engineers decided, you know what? We're going, we're smarter than them. Let's, let's come up with a strategy. Let's keep this ball from them. We're not going to let them score again, and we're going to just keep this ball. They got all up into their stuff. Their brains, their intellect, and they just pass that ball. That ball didn't even touch the ground, and it was like a show going on. They were passing around, passing around, and the clock started going three, two, one, boom! And they just jumped up and down, and they were screaming, "Yay, yay!" The fans that came there, the nerdy ones with them, they were up on the sidelines going, "Yay, yay!" They were fired up, and they were doing all that. Then all of a sudden, they looked down on the other end. You know, they saw all the bas all the basketball players. They were going, "Yay!" And they're, sta they're starting to stand and going, yay! And then when you look up, you find that the engineers were the ones that are actually down 63-64. They were so caught up in their strategy, so caught up in so many other things that they forgot to play the game. And now the clock had run out. There was nothing they could do. I'm afraid a lot of churches are becoming like that. Caught up in the program. Caught up in strategic things, you know, the buildings, the, you know, uh, uh, you know, where are we going to be physically? And so distracted by so much, they missed the game. 
The game is the harvest of souls. It's the winning of people to the Lord. That's what that's all about. But instead, what I got going on is bigger than that. I'm not going to forgive anybody with bitterness because that's more important than repenting and winning souls. I'm not going to sacrifice because selfishness is more important. Come on. I am not going to change because rebelliousness, my freedom of expression is more important. Yeah. Or I've already arrived. My self-righteousness cannot be touched. Come on. And let the harvest slip away because of what's going on. Yeah. Who's the most famous person on the planet? Michael Jackson. Who else? Michael Jordan. Who else? Oprah Winfrey. Who else? Obama. Who else? LeBron James. That's a horrible name. LeBron James. <laughs> who? Who? Donald Trump. I don't even know who that is. Oh my God. Donald Trump. That's the area. That's the ocean. Oh my God, y'all, y'all, y'all turn up. Nobody said Jesus of Nazareth. Wrong, 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 wrong. You know the most famous character on the planet? No, Mickey Mouse. Everybody know Mickey. Everybody know Mickey. Tell me one of you don't know who Mickey Mouse is. Raise your hand if you don't know Mickey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to Disneyland in Japan. So here it is, a figment of our imagination, a non-existent real character is more known than Jesus Christ. We are wasting time. We are truly wasting time. We we have so much in us. We won't give it up. We won't do it at all because that's more important than the harvest. Come on. You know, someone has said that they have no fear that the church will not succeed, but that it will succeed in those things that do not matter. It does not matter how big a lives we build. How much education we get. You know, it doesn't even matter if we're able to run our miles and invite people to church. The farmer who fails to harvest fails. We talk constantly about having your own personal ministries. But the farmer who doesn't go get the harvest. In this passage, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Jeremiah is talking to Judah and Israel. And he is telling them of doom and disaster that has to come because of their rebellion toward God. In fact, in the same chapter, he declares a few things. In verse 13, he said he tells them that their fields would be ruined. In verse 17, that their cities would be destroyed. And in verse 19, that the people would be either killed or taken captive. Now, Jeremiah had warned that only God could deliver them from this thing. Only God could deliver them. But the Israelites chose uh, to align themselves with the Egyptians. Instead of God, they went to the world. They went somewhere else. Well, the Babylonians come. They march right through the Egyptians, take them on out, and head right on in to Israel. And so here it is, the whole city here is surrounded. Now, in those times, you live inside the walls. So the city is outside the walls, and that's where all the crops, and that's where all everything is. And so all they had to do was to wave them out until they surrendered. The food and everything inside were drawn, were drawn out, and they just wave them out. Until they surrendered. And all the people in the city could do was to watch as the harvest passed by. 
You know, having a stuck time, you want to get hungry. But they can't do it. And they got to watch it spoil, watch it rot. And I'm sure the Babylonians had a good time probably walking around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All they could do was watch it. And the harvest only had some months. It'll go away. So all they can say is we're not safe. I want to talk about three things from this passage that I want us to get. If I may indulge you a little bit. Come on. Because I'm not sure we really get it. Point one is this. The reality, the reality of the loss. Let me give you some statistics. Now first, the statement in this right here says the harvest is past. And I believe right before our own very eyes for a lot of us, the harvest is passing. Listen to these statistics. Now these are just by secular Christianity statistics. I wonder what it would be with us, totally. He says that the unevangelized population of the earth called the world is growing at a rate 23,600. These numbers are off, but they're staggering. They, they, they parallel us easily. But 23,600 persons per day faster than we are being evangelized. In other words, more people are like, being more lost than we're evangelizing to the tune of almost 27,000 every day. Every day. You see the need for weeping? It says of the 95 people that would be in, you know, come to the Lord, make Jesus Lord. 87 of them will already be, I'm already a Christian. How many of y'all can count that? Oh, yeah. I'm already a Christian. I was raised in church. Why are you living like that? Unfortunately, look at some of us and go, why are you living like that? Keep it real. Come on. Hmm. Point. Point 0.3% will be extended individuals who have no knowledge or have not heard the gospel. Only 0.3%. Out of 7 billion people in the world, 4.4 billion in the world who have never, that have never heard the gospel. Now think about this. That's 23 people a minute, 1,400 people an hour, 32,600 people per day, 235,000 per week, and 12,230,000 12, people per year die without ever hearing the gospel. Right here before our eyes in America is dying. Since 1980, there's been no growth in the number of adults that are becoming Christians no, no more. It's not gone up. The fastest growing religions is not even the Christianity anymore, as we would know it, but it's Mormons, the Holy Witness, and other various cults. The harvest is passing for us individually, too. Now, it's proven that people tend to come to Christ more in the prime of their life. You know, those late 20s, middle 30s. Up there. But, that statistic doesn't necessarily show well within the churches. There's at least statistics. If a person hasn't become a Christian by the time they're 21, their chances are now 5,000 to 1 that they will ever be saved. If they haven't come to them by the time they're 30, the chances are 15,000 to 1. If they haven't been saved by the time they're 40, chances are 30 to 1. By 50, 150 to 1. After that, just forget it. 60, 70, 80. It gets tougher and tougher. But there are more important things. I woke up this morning 
And um, on CNN, and they had a, I guess this week is the Pride Week. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is that the parade and the stuff stuff today and everything? The, the, the gay pie parade. Yeah. And there was a lady. She was 93 years old, and she they had a photo of her holding a picture of her, you know, for her daughters. It says, uh, "I adore my uh, lesbian daughters," and it just says something simply, "Keep them safe." Now, here's the thing. She's 93. She's been going to this, uh, I guess, this parade for 50 years. So they had like a flashback. Somehow they captured pictures of her throughout different times. You see the lady from a young woman, little, you know, all the way up to 93 years old, and now she says that they're Christian. That um, you know, she, she, she goes on on that rant, and only God can judge. She'll know that He already has. Um, and it was just, it was a very telling to me how people are stuck on 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 what they think is right or what is important to them, but not on the things of God, the hardest of God. And then she was 93, just as defiant. Just as defiant. And I just wish I could have met that old lady and pleaded with her to save herself. <coughs> There's so many that will die with their teeth clenched. And so many that will die because they haven't heard the word of God. The gospel. So there's a reality here. Even for the best of our times and what we do, there's going to be a great deal of loss. Not everyone will be saved. But there we be like the imprisoned Israelites under the siege of the Babylonian, watching it die? Come on. Or do we heed God's voice? As Jeremiah tried to do. Point one, the loss is real. And we got to feel. We must feel. Bro, you make me feel that good. I want you to today. I want your heart to break. I want you to leave here today thinking about it. Now, point two, the reason for the loss. The reason. Well, the reason for the loss here says because the summer has ended. As I said, the harvest is somewhere between May and June. When it's done, now you just got the heat of the sun burning down on, 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 on whatever they're harvesting, and it's just going to rot it. It's too late once that starts to happen. You ever, you ever seen fruit on a tree or something? You know, and it rots if you don't pick it. The soil is with people. You ever act like it's super open, but you were lackadaisical? You don't have, you don't have the urgency. I'm going to get to them. Oh, they don't understand. i got to change this point and change this time. I'm going to get to them. Come on. And then by the time you get back, they're not open anymore. Yeah. That was fruit that's right. That was right. It opened. And now it's right. When the, saint, when the Christian, when the disciple dies, that means that summer has had. And there are two things that you will never have an opportunity to do in heaven. First of all, sharing is over. You never, you never will be told to share your faith again. That's not going to happen. But you also, you're never going to uh, be asked for a contribution. No tithes, no offerings, no missions. Someone said, that's why we'll be happy in heaven. <laughs> I don't need to be none of that. But you know the other thing, there will not be any. There will be no soul in it. Anybody that you're going to follow up right now, when you reach that side of things, you cannot reach back. It's over with. So the summer's ended also for the sinner. But it's too late. It's too late. There's a young man. He was going to go out and party. And of course, against his mom's wishes. And he, uh, a bad young man, and do what he wanted to do. So his mother 
He writes a few scriptures down, puts them in his hands, and he's leaving. He says, Four scriptures? Why do you keep giving me scriptures? Everybody, I go around, keeps giving me scriptures. I want to go somewhere where they won't give me scriptures. She said, You go right there. They won't give you any scriptures there. <laughs> You can go right to hell. <laughs> they won't give you man another, my brother. I said, man another scripture. <laughs> the sun is setting on the harvest. I don't know when God is going to return. None of us do. The Bible teaches not even the son of man knows. But it does say, you know, the night is coming when no one can work. John 9, 4. We will have an eternity to celebrate victories. But we can never, ever, recapture the harvest that's lost at the end of summer. Who's in your mind right now? Who's in your mind right now? That's our weakness. That's our plan. That's our harvest. Because you see, the result, point three, the result is lost, is that it's fine. Nothing else at all will matter. Not a single thing will matter. See, bro, I've never, ever, ever heard you be this dreary. I've never heard you do that. Because there was never a need for us to be more urgent than now. Right. Come on. As we go into these five regions, you know, uh, I thought they were going to stone me back in kids came and were mad at me. Still mad. I've explained the reason over and over so that we can be effective in those communities Come on. in which we now will have churches. Yep. But stuff, but there's stuff. I miss my relationship. Oh. Hey, bro, I'm upset. I don't got very selfish. I don't got notes. For real, no emails. Because I don't understand. The result of missing the harvest in the north. The result of missing the harvest in the west. The result of missing the harvest in the south. The result of missing the harvest of the Latin the har the missing the harvest downtown. Come on, help us out, bro. Did I say the West? But the result of letting the summer in, I'm not talking about this physical, is the harvest that we can never get back. Come on. Which is the last statement that makes the status of all, and we are not safe. Now, in the text, in the Hebrew, that word Messiah means to actually be saved from judgment. So it's not saved from the siege of the Babylonians, but it's to save from the judgment of God. We are not saved. Can you imagine that? Having to meet our Creator and not be saved. Will anything else matter that we done? No. At that point? I'm going to read y'all this corn. I'm about to close out here. Y'all look too sad. Keep it coming, bro. I think I did my job. I, I, I want to call some issues this morning. So I think I've accomplished what I'm after. So I know when to cut it down. But let me read you this corn. Give you a little challenge and we'll be done. We have, uh, have a song with Roger. What's the corn? We're going we're gonna to do the communion. But then after that, Roger. Oh. Because. I do want when you take the communion today to get, to get difference. Not don't just drop your sins on God. And say, Lord, do we make a new commitment to His harvest? Make the death that He has suffered mean something. Make it mean something. Not just something we can wear on our necks or an ear, maybe, or plaster up somewhere. But it means something because that doesn't matter. When the summer's ended. Yep. When the choir's song is last anthem and the preacher 
has prayed his last prayer, when the people have heard their last sermon, and the sound has died out in the air, when the Bible lies closed on the altar, and the pews are all empty of men, and each one stands facing his record, and the great book is open, what then? When the actor has played his last drama, and the mimic has made his last fun, when the film has flashed its last picture, and the billboards display its last run, when the crowd seeking pleasure have vanished and gone out into the darkness again, and the trumpet of the angels has sounded, and we stand for him one day. When the bugle's call sinks into silence, and the long marching column stands still, when the captain repeats his last orders, and they've captured the last four and heal, when the flag is hauled down from the masthead, and the wounded of the field checked in, and a world that rejected its savior is asked for a reason, what then? What then? Prayerfully, it's not because they have not heard the gospel. The harvest has passed, the sun, summer has ended, and we are not saved. It's that time in between there. And the fruit rots. Well, let me leave you with this. I'm going to need to page your notes. So, there's a couple who were greatly in love. They have a little child, a little boy. They look like that, yeah. Little, little, little age and walking, young mom and dad enjoy the beauty of that relationship that they see. And they were in a wheat field. I don't know if you've ever been in a wheat field. I've been in a couple of them. And in the sunlit day, it looked like gold shimmering things. You look out across it, it's a beautiful sight to see. And he walked along, and you know, it's just incredible to see. And so the mom and the dad were walking with the sun through this, this field and enjoying the blessing of their camaraderie and their. Their, their, their friendship and their marriage and their lives and they got so far out that all of a sudden they forgot they didn't see their son anymore. They didn't see their son anymore. They began to call out from him and the husband said, you go this way and I'll go this way and they, they went and they were screaming for their son and, and as they got uh, further and further out, they got further and further away from the spot in which they realized that he was missing. And they continued going and finding that it was futile and they were not finding their son at home because there were thousands of acres of this land they decided to go into the town and get some help. And so they got some of the townspeople, and many of them volunteered and came on out and began looking for a little boy. And they were spread out and scattered out, and they did their thing. But they could not find the boy. And then someone had the idea. They said, let's make arms. Let's walk in a chain. Let's walk as one through this field. We've got to find it. Then we've got every inch covered. Let's just walk hand in hand. And they began to walk, and as they walked, all of a sudden they heard a cry from down the chain of the line, just a few, like a hundred feet down. Hey, I found something, we found him! And everybody, the mom and the dad, and everybody began to rush into that area where the boys came out calling that we found the boy. But it was too late, for he had been exposed too long. He had been exposed too long. I wonder how many people are lost like that, waiting for a unified body to link. Come on now. To walk that field where the harvest is plentiful. Shall we be that in this city? Shall we be that in the north? Shall we be that in the west? Shall we be that in the south? Shall we be that downtown? Shall we be that in the right district? Shall we go? Diversified, walking arm in arm, hand in hand, through the field, not missing one square inch of this great land, finding every soul before it's exposed. Shall we not? As I tell you, that harvest is ready. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. You're farmers. Will you join me? Will you join me? If you don't know, Lord, thank you. Part of that harvest. Let, let the word of God, let the spirits of us, let us get in there. Let's, let us harvest you. If you stop harvesting, get back to work. And if you've been harvesting, let us link up hand in hand. We go through this great city. Every soul. Every soul.
Amen. 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 Amen.